What's up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Periodic Table. This is the show where uh, we talk about the hottest science news stories of the week. And are we experts by any means? Most of the time, no, absolutely not. But that's okay, because this is one big virtual science classroom where we're all learning more together, we're growing more together, and you know, we're just building a fun little scientific community here on the interwebs where I think we can... Uh, I don't know, better ourselves, I guess, you know, uh, that's what it's all about, right? But um, I'm, of course, if you don't know me, I'm your host, Brandon Hanna. Um, uh, you might know me formerly as a host over at AfterBuzz TV, the Popcorn Talk Network, or even over at the movie Trivia Schmodown. But what you might not know is that I'm also a mechanical engineer and I have a passion and love for all things science, science communication and STEM. And doing this show uh, is a passion of mine. And I love bringing on really great people, really great friends to talk about science uh, with me. And I am not alone here today. Um, you might know him. He is a movie reviewer. He's got his own amazing YouTube channel um, that I encourage you all to check out. But he's also newly a features writer over at Screen Rant. It is Garrett McDowell. Welcome to the show. Hello, everybody. Uh, as I told you when you invited me on the show, I uh, am an absolute buffoon when it comes to science. So uh, hopefully I can fake it until I make it towards the end of the show uh, and use my wit and maybe a little bit of humor along the way to, <laughs> to be as good of a, go a host as possible. Because, uh, yeah, if we're actually talking about the periodic table, just me going to be like, hey, man, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's perfectly OK most of the time. I don't know what we're talking about all that well either, but like I said, like we're just we're learning something new together. I, I try my best every week, and sometimes I do better than others to make this show sound super professional and you know make myself you know uh, sound like the world's greatest science communicator. I try to get into character. I wear this lab coat every single week, uh, and I do my best, but I stumble. I stumble over my own words. You know, I actually yeah. am. This is my first show I've done in a month because, as you know, I recently moved. And if yeah. you're watching on YouTube, you can see the new background behind me, guys. Um, new new setting. Uh, and so so I, life's I, been... I'm the inductee into the new apartment <laughs> is what you're saying. Yes. Wow. That's, that's exactly it. What a it. milestone. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the, you're the new inductee on my apartment. I've never done the periodic table at this apartment. So... <laughs> There you go. So the Perfect. Feeling is mutual. <laughs> yes, we're sharing our new apartments with the world here today. Uh, and we're going to talk about some great science news stories. Um, first of all, we're going to be breaking down this really cool story about uh, bacteria making a spider silk that is stronger than steel. Um, what's going on? Is Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man involved? We're going to talk about it. And we've also got a story about brainless sponges containing early echoes of a nervous system. Did our nervous system evolve in a similar way to how sponges anatomically work? Possibly. Uh, but we also have an amazing special segment for you all here today. Something similar to what I did with Ken Knapsack about a month back on this show. I'm going to interview Garrett. We're going to just have a little, you know, one on one session asking him, um, you know, some things about himself and science and education and you name it. And before we get into that super fun segment, let's go back up to our number one story here for you all this week. And we are talking about bacteria making spider silk that is stronger than steel. And uh, normally off the top of my head in my notes here, I have uh, the sources of these articles, um, but I forgot to do that in my notes today. But guys, the links to all the articles are always in the description down hey, below. I've if got you them, check if, you, them out. if you want the assist here, if you want the oh. alley-oop assist, I've got them yes. right here. Please, Garrett, uh, with the come, assist, where does this story come from? It comes from Science News for Students, but also for Garrett. podcasters, too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I do love Science News. I use them on this show a lot, especially Science News for Students, I find, is a great publication to get stories from because, um, like I said, we're not experts. So anything that is written in a way for a student to learn and understand, I think we are all students of science when we come here every single week and thank you for the assist garrett absolutely appreciate it Cri call me but, chris paul <laughs> <laughs> all right chris paul well we've got um the bacteria making spider silk that's grown it's grown by microbes and spun in a lab as the article says it's part natural spider silk and part human innovation so uh, according to this story here 
uh, scientists have long dreamed about making synthetic spider silk and turning it into all types of lightweight materials from super strong fabrics to surgical threads. Uh, but while making silk may be easy for spiders, it's proven very hard for engineers. Uh, and now our group thinks they've finally done it. And their trick is enlisting the help of bacteria. And the result, everyone, is an artificial silk that is stronger and tougher than what even some spiders can make. And for the first time ever, we can reproduce not only what nature can do, but go beyond what natural silk can do. And this is coming um, from one of the en chemical engineers who worked on the product. And I saw this story online and I thought, this is perfect. We have to talk about it. Are we going to see an actual real world Spider-Man using this technology <laughs> at some point in the next decade? When I hear spider webs stronger than steel, that's immediately where my head goes. I don't know about you, Garrett. Um, but I want you to answer answer you know that that question. Did your head go there as well reading this article, or did uh, maybe you your thoughts went down other paths? Were you intrigued by this technology? What did you learn um, coming through this? You know what I thought is the first thing is you know for the past several years now we've been thinking that we, we are avoiding bacteria at all costs, so now we're utilizing it uh, to make a, a a children's toy here. <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, I, it reminded me honestly of that. That you know, the, uh, when, as a kid, when you when you watch something uh, like a like a Spider Man movie or a comic book movie or Star Wars or whatever it is or Star Trek, and you see these fantastical things, the it's it's almost inherent in us to be like, I want to do that. I want to create that. I've, I've seen people try to make lightsabers or, or or you know whatever the case may be, and now it seems like it's the equivalent of you know this toy that I had when I was a kid because uh, I grew up with the Tobey Maguire films where it had like this little CO2 canister and it was on your wrist and you would like push the little plunger down and it would shoot like silly string. So this seems to be that, but you know, like on steroids, like to the nth degree where who knows if people are actually going to be able to swing on these types of things or if they're able to use it as threads or strong fabrics like this, you know, like this says, you know, are we going to be seeing scientists swinging down Manhattan? Probably not, uh, but this is a good start for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I could just like see like if this were a movie, like scientists working on this development, someone coming in and being like, oh, how's the new, you know, artificial web technology coming along? And it's like, oh, yeah. it's coming along great. And then a quick cut to scientists swinging around New York City. <laughs> Yeah, like, like oh, I like, we're a little behind. <laughs> I, I like to think that like the manager, you know, is like it's not it's not the Spider Man web, but the nerds there are absolutely like, no, this is we're making Spider Man stuff in real life. They're just <laughs> getting super jazzed about it, and the manager's like trying to get him to take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's 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 what I would be trying to do. If of I course, was on this absolutely. Project. Yeah, we're like kidding it. ourselves. Yeah, I mean if if Peter Parker could do it in his bedroom, uh, who's to say that these uh, professional scientists with probably lab coats like yourself you know they probably have the funding and the time to actually be able to do this for real and not just be pulling dr pepper cans across the room you know <laughs> <laughs> i mean if there were a can to to pull across the room that's i think one that i would pull maybe that or you know an a and w cream soda perhaps what would oh, be your soda of choice soda. Uh, i'm a big red cream soda guy uh if i could have that you know at will or maybe get like a a, a coke and then a rum right next to it and just like impromptu rum and coke <laughs> whenever my heart desired yeah that or like getting the remote you know when you're like Ugh. It's across the room. I don't really want to have to go get it. Or I left my phone over there. You could just whip it over to you. It wouldn't have to get up out of the couch. So yeah, it'd be convenient. <laughs> That's what they did this for. Just so we could uh, stay on the couch and not have to go get the remotes. <laughs> As you can tell, neither one of us got the with great power comes great responsibility speech. Absolutely not. What did what did Uncle Ben know? He got shot anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, that took a turn. But uh, no, guys, this uh, story is pretty cool. There's some really interesting science that I'm still uh struggling to understand i've read this story a couple times now but there's some really cool stuff going on like the nano level there's there's nano crystals actually involved in the key to this it's the key to the, the success of this uh technology as the article says here proteins are the complex molecules that give living things their structure and function a spider silk making proteins called spidroids 
form in its abdomen as a dense liquid and spinnerets uh, body parts of the spider's rear end spin the liquid into long threads and silk protein molecules are arranged in a tight repeating structure called a nanocrystal and spanning a few billionths of a meter um, these crystals are the source of a spider's silk's strength and the more nanocrystals in a fiber the stronger the silk thread will be. And a common problem that scientists have faced in creating uh, fibers with enough nano nanocrystals to form silk, uh, but it looks like that's kind of something that they are now able to uh, achieve um, with utilizing this bacteria, if I'm reading this uh, story correctly, which sure. is super cool. There's a lot of interesting science that um, I don't think either myself or Garrett can speak too much on yeah um but as i said guys if you want to dig deeper fall down that rabbit hole the uh, please i encourage everyone read the story uh for yourselves and leave a comment down below letting us know your thoughts um maybe you know kind of i would love it if someone could make a simple like paragraph that kind of easily explains the science and technology uh, sure. behind this invention because I think that would be something super cool and not that yeah. I'm like trying to take notes to make my own Spider-Man sure. thread. And it's not like we need a summary or anything because we get it. We understand the concept. But for everybody else, if you could dumb it down a little bit, that would be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really for for everyone it. else. For yeah, everyone not for else. us, to be clear. Yeah. For everybody else, for sure. <laughs> the listeners. <laughs> for sure. Uh, but it's super cool. And something that I do understand as an engineer is that... Uh, engineers actually tested the strength of these fibers by pulling on them and pulling on them until they broke. Um, and they also recorded how long a fiber stretched before snapping and the ability to stretch meant that the fibers were tough. And um, this new hybrid silk beat some natural spider silks in both strength and toughness, um, which kind of leads on to making a spider silk that is as strong as steel, right? Something that maybe Spider-Man actually could swing sure. from building to building with. Uh, which I find really exciting. But Garrett, I want to throw it back to you. Is there anything else about this story that uh, caught your attention? Yeah, I think uh, when, when when I'm reading this and the the fiber and the silk uh, makes me think of uh, like clothing. And I'm curious to see if something like this could be woven into some type of like tactical gear. You know, like the military could use this to make like new lightweight Kevlar or you know protection or some sort of you know if it's as strong as steel. I don't I don't know if it's if steel. Uh, the tensile strength of that is like stronger than Kevlar. I'm not really sure the science behind that. Uh, but if it is, that would be really interesting to see them uh, implement that. And then we would have a bunch of spider men and women on the front lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. I think the article does kind of briefly touch on like, what are the possible uses of this technology? Like, is it like textiles um, for like maybe military application, like you said? Sure. Um, the article also mentions even artificial muscle fibers, which would definitely be something I would want to to learn yeah. more about. And how would that work? in the medical field um do they maybe want to use this for stitching for like surgeons um right. maybe they're um uh, maybe they feel this can be like a more like natural way of you know kind of sewing people up after surgery um mm -hmm. rather than trying to go other you know routes i'm really curious as to to how far this technology can go in the future and uh, how beneficial uh, it could be for humanity, I feel like, because um, that's I always try to find those types of stories sure. on this show because there's just every time every week I Google science news stories and there's now more than ever so much negativity <laughs> out there when it comes yeah. to what's going on in the latest science news, especially when you obviously talk about the pandemic and vaccines. And, you know, we've talked about that all to death. And so fun, optimistic stories like this always catch my attention. Absolutely. And it's, it's cool that this, uh, this website is providing, uh, you know, stories for students. I don't know if the students is referring to college students or high school students, uh, but it's cool that they're able to bring these stories to light and just kind of be like, Hey, these are, you know, those scientists that you think about, yeah, they're, they're actually doing stuff. They're, they're not just, you know, sitting around just continuing to be scientists on the big bang theory. They're actually working. Uh, and I feel like a lot of technology is developed from concepts from nature and the fact that they're using, uh, you know, the spider web, which is a, you know, a very uh, strong uh, tool that the spider uses to, you know, capture prey and, and I'm sure other things. It's cool that we're looking towards that to uh, develop our own technology. 
Yeah, for sure. That was a great way to look at it, I think, Garrett. And I think the article even talks specifically about what type of spider um, that they were using as inspiration, what they were comparing it uh, to this new synthetic silk. Uh, and I'm trying to find it in my notes. Uh, here it is. Uh, the banana spider or the golden silk spider, it is uh, also known as. Um, but mainly, um, they turned to uh, it, the main name, I guess the spider goes by is the female uh, golden orb weaver. Mm -hmm. And there's also a very scientific name that sounds like an obscure dinosaur. So but <laughs> I don't even think I'm going to attempt that one. Anyone who uh, watches or listens to this show on a weekly basis knows that I do not pronounce words so good sometimes. Yeah. Um, but this is actually, I think, a spider that I've, I've seen photos on. Um, People uh, are excited when they come across these spiders. They spin beautiful webs. I think I came across a video on Facebook once of like a, like a front porch camera filming one of these spiders spin okay. an elaborate web on this person's like front porch, um, which was super cool because uh, they, they do appear in forest uh, in the southern United States, uh, believe it or not. So mm. I thought that was a particularly interesting uh, little tidbit. Um and they call it a dragline silk, I believe it says here in the article. And it appears like a delicate floss, um, but it is much stronger and stretchier than steel, which is um, not something you would probably think immediately by looking at it. So yeah. pretty cool, pretty awesome story. Um, and yeah, I thought I was going to have a much better segue moving on to the next topic. Hey, you nailed it. Blank. It's flawless. Nobody even noticed. We're already on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> We're already on to the next, next topic. That's how good we are. Uh, no, but before we move on to that next, 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 next topic, I just want to thank everyone uh, watching this show on YouTube, listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever platform uh, you enjoy listening to your podcast on. Thank you so much for tuning in here today. If you like this video here on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that little notification bell so you don't miss a thing and leave a comment down below. Let us know how we're doing. Are we communicating the science effectively? Uh, I would love it. I've always wanted someone to like post like one of those long comments, like either further explaining something to me or correcting me of something wrong that I said, because I think that's important to to communicate effectively that you don't know everything and also admit when you do something wrong because it creates a conversation and we all learn more together. So please, I encourage you guys to, to comb through every single word that I'm saying here today and let me know your yeah. thoughts in the yeah, comment make, section make down sure below. Make sure you restart the video in case you missed anything. Send it to friends, you know, see if they want to <laughs> catch anything too. Just be super diligent about it, guys. You'll get something eventually. Think of this as a safe space to go on like a long <laughs> rant. Like one of those, like like you had a bad day, you see someone posted something you disagree with online, you just want to argue with them. Like yeah. put that energy towards me. This is a safe <laughs> space to do that. <laughs> I think that's that's something I think that we can start doing. I like yeah. that a lot. Inviting um, criticism, yeah. <laughs> yes, there you go. And guys, if you're listening on audio uh, platform, please, uh, you know, rate the, the podcast, leave a positive review if you can. You know, if you want to leave like a mildly negative review, hey, a review's a review. You know, I'll take what I can get. Yeah, but I appreciate humble. you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you tuning in anyway. Uh, it means a lot. Um, so please, guys, uh, go do all those things. And let's talk about... I was gonna, I was gonna like try to say something stupid about brainless sponges. I'm like, don't be a brainless sponge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but brainless sponges, guys, uh, they contain early echoes of a nervous system. And Garrett, tell us all where this story comes from. Uh, this comes from ScienceNews.org. Uh, these uh, good people at ScienceNews.org has uh, compiled this article. Uh, explaining this very complex uh, topic and just with the spider webs or breaking it down in a way that uh, makes sense to a couple of normies like you and me or you know me I don't have the degree in that um. <laughs> it's okay you know I have an engineering degree I don't necessarily have like a science degree and you know sure, yeah. sure. Well, I'm not sure you know <laughs> I know things mechanically you ask me to build something design something I'm like I could work with a scientist you know I can understand half of what they're saying but there's always a lot of cool news stories to write and shout out to science science news science news <laughs> uh, this time not just for students this one's for everybody um, but brains guys are like sponges slurping up new information but sponges may also be a little like brains 
Sponges, which are humans, very distant evolutionary relatives, which was something I learned for the first time today, they don't have nervous systems, but a detailed analysis of sponge cells turned up what might be an echo of our own brains. Cells called neuroids that crawl around the animal's digestive chambers and send out messages, um, which I think is super fascinating. So you're telling me that sponges have these cells that actually go through like their digestive track and it's sending out messages like neurons, like sending off electrical signals in your brain throughout your body. That's super cool. And it, I like, you know, stories like this are also super fascinating because you're taking um, something that is existing, you know, in, in this case, a, a creature type, you know, some actual biology that's out there and kind of like, relating it back to humans and learning more about our own existence and, you know, our own evolutionary track, I guess might be a way to put it. Um, I hope, I hope that's an appropriate way to put it, but either way, I think that's super cool. Any type of science that helps us learn more about ourselves and make us something outward that makes us look inward, I think is particularly cool. Um, but before I move on with this story, Garrett, I want to throw it back over to you. What was your overall impressions looking at this story? Um, were you just as fascinated as I was reading this? Uh, I think my reaction was similar to the uh, the spider web story, and I don't know if it's a reflection of uh, my own juvenile tendencies, but I went back to my childhood and I thought of none other than Mr. SpongeBob SquarePants himself. You know, I don't I know that these uh, sponges are maybe a little bit brainless, but um, I don't know if they also live in a pineapple under the sea. Uh, but yeah, it's it's it, when you watch a show like that as a kid, I didn't really und I didn't I thought SpongeBob was like a kitchen sponge. I didn't know that like sponges in the ocean were actual uh, you know. Li uh, living creatures with their own, you know, uh, with their own brains and their own nervous system, apparently doing their own kind of thing. So reading this and even learning that the the uh, sponges without brains are also developing their own nervous system. I don't know if this is something that like we're just now discovering, or if these like specific sponges are you know evolving and developing their own nervous system. I'm sure we'll discuss that uh, further into detail here. Uh, but I've always found the the um, you know the ocean and and uh, uh, nautical creatures and all of these things very fascinating and kind of spooky because there's so much stuff under there and so much creepy things that even the sponges have thoughts of their own apparently so <laughs> i'm excited to learn more about this and i'm uh, sure you'll be able to break it down for us <laughs> yeah it's uh you know it is like you said a cool story and it's i think i had that same thought as a kid i'm like wait yeah he's not a kitchen sponge spongebob square pants that's a real yeah. thing although he is shaped like a kitchen sponge which... totally yeah, you know, it's kind of like how Squidward, I think, is really an octopus, but they call him Squidward because it just sounds better. Yeah, absolutely. Octopus <laughs> tentacles wouldn't really it's just roll off the tongue, you know, octopus word. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't quite <laughs> doesn't, doesn't quite work. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does not. But yeah, it was really cool to learn about these cells called neuroids. And um, that is what like caught scientist uh, attentions and and how they are involved in nerve cell signaling and the article kind of goes into this you know aha moment of realizing oh my goodness like these these cells that we're looking for they're they're in the digestive chambers of the sponges and you can see how this is like potentially a precursor you know to how the human nervous system works how the human brain works and it's just on like a simpler level um, which I think also works great as an analogy that you can use for teaching, you know, young students how, you know, the the nervous system works and saying like, hey, let's take a look at sponges. This is just kind of like a mm -hmm. simplified version of something much more complex that's going on right. um, within ourselves. Um, so, you know, really fascinating story. I think not too much to like dive into here, but um just something that's cool, something that we can, you know, spend five ish, 10 minutes talking about and um, just kind of saying like, wow, like, man, science is cool, right? Science is cool. They're always figuring stuff out. And I'm wondering if this is something that because I know when I was a, you know, a youngster and I'm sure some of the listeners and you as well. Uh, doing like the dissection of, of creatures, you're not going to go and, you know, bring a cadaver in and, and, you know, cut up some poor families like grandpa or something like that in the seventh grade. You always start with something like really, you know, the life form is, is you know, not terribly complex. Like I, we did an earthworm and then, you know, a frog. And then when you go into college, you do like, you know, 
cats or whatever. I don't know what people do. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. So I, didn't, I didn't have to do that kind of stuff in school. But I'm wondering uh, if these sponges would be something uh, to, you know, to take a look at and to see uh, all of these uh, different, uh, the, the nervous system running throughout the sponges. I wonder if it's something that you can like visibly see. I don't know if these sponges are rarer or if it's like, a, you know, if they're everywhere. Uh, but that'd be cool for uh, students to be able to look at these and to maybe understand how their own nervous system works in a way. Yeah, for sure. I think actually the story did point out um, that the sponge that they studied specifically is called the Spongilla lacustris. Mm. Probably butchered that pronunciation. Hey, your guess is as good as mine. So, <laughs> uh, But it's actually a freshwater sponge that grows in lakes in the northern hemisphere. And then there's a fun little tidbit here about how they jokingly called it the Godzilla of sponges um, because Godzilla rhymes with Spongilla. <laughs> no, they definitely were making Spider-Man jokes then. Okay, if, if they're stretching that much <laughs> with the Godzilla of sponges yeah. here. Yeah, these guys are just as big as nerds as we are apparently. So <laughs> For sure. They, they, they stretched to get a Godzilla uh, reference when the Spider-Man reference is right like in front right of you. It's right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, cool story, guys. And I also thought there's like a little tidbit at the end here, I thought this was neat about how there's actually not um, that many uh, organisms out there that can tell us a lot about the origins of the nervous systems of not just ourselves, but other animals and sponges are one of the few that we can look at to kind of give us these glimpses into our own uh, evolution, which uh pretty cool shout out to sponges but um <laughs> enough about sponges for the week let's move on to our special segment here today and um last time i did this i called it five minutes with ken but it ended yeah. up going a lot longer than five minutes sure um, yeah but you know let's just say five minutes with garrett why not? okay I i'm That's here for it five minutes with garrett sounds like a like a like a game you would play you know like <laughs> you gotta like spin the bottle five minutes with garrett oh no it's gonna get spicy i, I think ken made the same joke and i was oh. like that's actually pretty good though that's like good, clever good, i think good yeah i think that piques people's interest like five minutes with garrett what's gonna happen here i have to tune in i have yeah, to tune or, or, in. or click away it's either one or the two <laughs> <laughs> one of the two uh, you know, I'll take my chances. Um, you know, either way, like, you know, you lose one audience, you gain a different audience. Maybe. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's just like a fun little interview segment for us to get to know each other a little better. So right off the bat, Garrett, um, obviously we talk about, you know, science and science communication and, ed and education in general on this show. So I just want to ask you, like, what was your favorite subject growing up in school? I'll tell you this, it definitely was not science. And I feel like what? that's because I had um, a specific teacher. I'm not going to name drop them here on the podcast because what if they listen? That would be rude. Um, <laughs> but they were kind of they were in that period in my in my educational growth where it's you're learning the fundamental like building blocks of science and if you don't get that the things that build on top of that aren't going to make a whole lot of sense and this person was kind of out the door like they were like one foot out the door they were like really close to retiring they had been teaching for a hundred years and they just flat out did not care anymore uh and and my uh, my mother who's a nurse practitioner who has obviously done lots of science throughout her her educational career i would be taking a uh, homework home and assignments home and she was just absolutely like blown away he's like he's like what are you teaching like like you know, like well, this homework doesn't like helpful at all and we were allowed to like look at notes and all of the exams and so i wasn't like truly learning so science in that in that period in my life I, I didn't have the drive to learn science i was like great i get it i get to have an a and move on you know so it was really one uh, in one year and out the other so science definitely wasn't it i always struggled with science um but i would say if you're talking about actual school subjects i was always really interested in history when i was a kid uh learning you know how did we get here what did past generations go through um unfortunately now like in hindsight i'm uh you know uh, understanding that a lot of the history that not just myself but a lot of kids in America learn isn't exactly accurate. Uh, it's a very, you know, abbreviated or pleasant version of history that we like to uh, kind of echo throughout generations to maybe make ourselves feel better <laughs> or, you know, keep those in power to, 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 
continue to like, no, we, the America we live in, it's great. Everything's been wonderful. Uh, you know, the Civil War and slavery, that was just like a little blip on the radar. Don't even worry about it, guys. You know, <laughs> so I even though I've been very interested in history, um, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that further generations can continue to develop history and, and to educate a more accurate uh, version of that, even though some of these, you know, pills that kids have to swallow might be a bit difficult to swallow. I think it's worth it in the long run. Uh, but I also, being a creative person, um, was always very interested uh, in uh, art and English as well, where we were uh, able to, you know, read something or create something and discuss it among one another. Um, I always really appreciated that. I did a lot more art when I was younger than I do now, mostly because of time and resources and space. I don't really have a lot of space to do art, uh, but I was always into the creative things versus, you know, the 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 kind of type a you know like this is the correct answer on the exam there's no other correct answer i like to be able to you know uh express myself a little bit more or in the case of literature uh being able to elaborate on a specific theme or a character trait or something where it's not exactly you can be wrong for sure uh but there's a little bit more leeway there and i'm sure my gpa also appreciated that too <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, history is great. I always uh, really liked history. And yeah, obviously, there's a lot, you know, going on, like in the news today about what type of history is taught in schools. Sure. And uh, very unfortunate. I, I hope that, you know, like you said, that our future generations can hopefully have a much more accurate understanding of history. I feel very fortunate myself, even though like my school teachings, um, you know, obviously kind of leaned in that direction where some mm -hmm. things are kind of like glossed over or like whitewashed or totally. what have you. Um, I, I feel fortunate that I, I feel like I did have a pretty decent education growing up where I, you know, I learned about, you know, obviously just to straight come out and say like, you know, racism and, yeah. you know, uh, obviously, you know, the civil war, the Holocaust, everything like, you know, I feel like my teachers growing up were pretty honest about that, but then there's also, you know, you know, elements of history that some of us, even with the best educations, didn't learn until watching the show Watchmen, where you're was, like, it's oh, it's funny you say that. I was literally just <laughs> thinking that because like, yeah. I remember that trailer came out for this show and, you know, people were talking about and I remember seeing tweets where people were like, what is this is this happened? And people were like, yeah, isn't that so messed up that you're just learning about it? And you're what, like. 30 <laughs> you know like I, I had no idea and it's such a shame that we have to learn about some of that stuff on a comic book tv show of all things mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah you know learning like all about you know like the terrible things that happened with like you know like there's like a there was a black wall street and like yeah. all kinds of like amazing things and amazing people like in sure. in you know like black american history that are just completely glossed over not to get like too much totally. into to, into all that but i th i think you you brought it up and it, it is uh super important and i think mm -hmm. that's the whole point of history right is to make sure that we don't repeat the bad things um, yeah. yeah but i want to get i want to get your opinion on you know what about like when history and science do kind of meet, like we kind of just touched on it, I think a little bit in that sponge story mm -hmm. um, where it's science, modern day science, that's helping us learn about our own past a little bit more. Does that yeah. maybe make science a little more interesting to you when those types of things happen? Oh, it's not a disinterest in science. It's purely like an understanding of science. Like I can read sure. the sponge story be like, cool. Can I tell you the minutia of how everything works and the synapses and name all of them that are happening to make the nervous system like function? Absolutely not. <laughs> so I can look at it and be like, that's really interesting. Sounds great. But, you know, being able to actually elaborate on it or, you know, be able to explain to someone else. That's always how I learned best is if you can explain it to somebody else then you really understand it and science was just never really that thing for me but in regards to history um, I do feel like a lot of scientific developments you know are directly tied to civilizations and you look at Rome and they were able to uh, achieve certain things with architecture uh, and engineering with water and all of these uh, these different things and of course industrial revolution all that kind of stuff so yeah science and history are very intrinsically tied with one another uh, in the in development of of a society and, and, and their, you know, scientific development are kind of the exact same thing. You know, if a society is very scientifically developed, then they're also a developed society too. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of, that's the great point. And I kind of like how 
science kind of like finds its way into other topics in school. Like we learn about history and there's, you know, science involved in like archaeology and paleontology and things sure. that tell us about our own past. And um, that's like there. I feel I feel like there's always these like avenues where like, OK, like, you know, you didn't like science class in school. You learned about the periodic table. You learned about the scientific method. You did yeah. these experiments you know you made a model volcano and it was like eh, fine whatever but like you know i'm not super into this but maybe there's like ways that it can tie in for me personally i always loved math uh growing up in school i don't know how you feel about math here, <laughs> it's even <laughs> worse than science even worse. <laughs> no I, I i avoided uh math at all costs even into college and now i was just like what class do I have to take to not take math? Thankfully, I was like good enough at math that I didn't have to take some of the entry levels uh, courses mm -hmm. with my SAT scores and all that kind of stuff. But math is just like, uh, just it's. <laughs> I just remember being in math class, just like, don't call on me, please don't call on me, and just like trying to get out of there as quickly as possible, uh, and asking a million questions and asking friends for help. Oh yeah, if you think science is bad, maybe math is probably even worse for me. <laughs> That's so funny because like for me, math was kind of my intro introduction to my love of science you know I'll take like biology and chemistry and I'll be like okay like this really isn't for me but then when I took physics I was like science and math yeah. okay I can get behind this I, well it's I can... the it's the exact opposite of what I was talking about to where it's <laughs> like there's no leeway it's the answer and if you don't get that exact answer you're wrong whereas mm -hmm. you know literature art is a lot more flexible you can put a lot more of yourself into it which you know I'm glad I picked the career choice that I did <laughs> you being an engineer makes sense that you're good at math it would be bad if you were like actually I suck at math <laughs> <laughs> you know for sure I always you know liked that better i think it's just how my brain works it's like no there's a right answer and totally. i'm gonna get it and then yeah. once i get it i know that i have it and that's it yeah. boom there you go done yeah. it's binary right sure. or wrong <laughs> exactly there you go feel safe it, it's that easy way. for me <laughs> <laughs> it's easy for me to figure out how to get the right answer than the philosophy about like is this right is it wrong is it somewhere sure. in the middle yeah i don't know uh, I like the gray but, area. But, I'm right in there. Yeah. <laughs> if you're black or white, I'm right in the gray area. That's my, that's my <laughs> sweet spot right there. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but before we wrap up here, I do want to ask you uh, one more question. And mm -hmm. I just want to, you know, obviously um, you're a movie guy. You know, we both love movies. Um, but uh, is there any like film in your life that sparked an interest in the scientific topic? Maybe it was like a science fiction film. Maybe sure. it was something like Apollo 13. Um, maybe it was a disaster movie. I don't know. But did you ever like look at the science in a movie and go like, wow, that's pretty cool. I want to like dive into that a little bit more just for fun. Yeah, I think a movie that was uh, not necessarily like sparked a, a real love for science, obviously. Um, but I think one that I think of that I watched when I was a kid uh, was Osmosis Jones. Was just, I don't know if uh, you know the listeners have seen it or if you've seen it, but it's an animated film uh, about this uh, man played by Bill Murray who gets sick, and then it shows you know what's happening in his body, but it's kind of personified with cartoon characters. Um, and I think that that's such an interesting concept that it's a, like this buddy cop mystery noir movie, but it's happening with germs and white blood cells and medicine and all this stuff. I think it's a really fun, creative movie. It's been a hundred years since I've seen it, so it might be totally garbage but I always thought that that was like a really interesting take and you know I watched it at an age where I didn't really understand all of the science and when I got a little bit older and still didn't understand all the science I was at least able to be like oh white blood cells they do they do that thing oh that makes sense why you know he's a police officer and all of that kind of stuff but in regards to recent memory and recent films um, I think the film that uses science and utilizes science the best and really does impact the plot and is used as a tool uh, is The Martian um, I think the, 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 that film and the creativity behind uh, the lead character there and what he's able to, to do with such limited resources and how he's able to use his, his intellect and his wit uh, to be able to survive with such limited resources, I think is uh, really fascinating. Uh, and it's you know not quite enough to make me like go into uh, biology here. I think he's uh, botany. Uh, I think that's what he, I think is Mark Watney is the character's name. Yeah. Um, but I've always thought that that was like a really interesting way 
way to show how science isn't just a means to an end, but it actually can be a way to survive and to be resourceful. I don't think I'd, I've really ever seen a movie quite like that before. Uh, and I think it utilizes science in such a, like a clear way. And I could totally see somebody watching that and be like, that's what I want to do. You know, that's, that's their star Wars or their Spider-Man, like we were talking about. And they go into that cause they're, you know, that's their hero or whatever. I could totally see that happening. Yeah, the, those are two great examples. I loved The Martian personally. Uh, someone who space is the reason why I, I became a mechanical engineer. Uh, and I used to work in aerospace for many, many years. Um, and, you know, I, I worked in like space systems and all that. And so watching The Martian when it came out, I was like, yeah, I think I'm in the right <laughs> right field for me. This is like yeah. what I want to do. This is so cool. Sure. Um, and I love you bringing up Osmosis Jones. I haven't seen that movie in like, at least a decade. I know it's been, <laughs> maybe it's more been such a long time. It's one of those movies but, that I guarantee if I was to watch now, there would be moments or scenes that just like scratch this weird part of my brain where I'm like, have like this brain blast back then. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like five again, you know, watching this movie. I'm sure it would do that if I was to watch it again. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, what a, what a great way to like teach kids like how white blood cells work and how sure. medicine uh, even works. You literally, you know, see like medicine, helping your own body's immune system fight off a disease i'm like that could be more timely than ever absolutely yeah. to revisit osmosis show <laughs> hey it would that actually let's green light that let's go ahead and call paramount or universal or whoever made that movie let's get it let's get a sequel on track here i think a lot of people could use <laughs> okay this is a cartoon <laughs> we're going to explain it as simply as possible of how this all works i think that that would be uh, really helpful for some people <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Two great examples, Garrett. Um, absolutely. Uh, this this segment was a lot of fun. It was super fun in general having you on the show. So thanks. Thanks so much for doing this with me here today. Absolutely. It was a pleasure being on here. I, I, I think it all worked out just fine. I was a little bit nervous. You were like, you want to come on a science show? I was like, oh boy, I'm the wrong guy to ask for this no. one. But I think it all uh, I think it all turned out OK. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Don't be nervous at all. Like, a, you know, I think it just makes the show more relatable. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, there's so many shows out there where you can like tune into experts and it's super great. Like I watch so much science communication content and there's so many amazing people out there uh, that, you know, are actually experts and can explain the science to you. But sure. sometimes I think it's just nice to like talk to people that are on your same scientific reading level, yeah. if you will. <laughs> and, you know, we're, we're all kind of learning together. We're all just trying to 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 take that next step to g grow a little smarter and uh better ourselves and so yeah uh, some of my favorite episodes that i've done on this podcast is when i have somebody come on and they go i really don't know anything about science <laughs> and i'm like you're gonna be perfect yeah, <laughs> don't okay. worry yeah every day is uh, a school day <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly so um yeah thank you so much uh for coming on the show um where can the good people find you online? Yeah, so you can follow me uh, at Twitter, um, at Garrett McDowell, just my name there, like it's spelled there at the bottom. Uh, I also run a team over screener, I'm a features writer there. Um, you can expect to see about four articles from me per week. I've got a lot of good stuff coming. I'm very excited to be a part of that. Um, I've been really passionate about film and uh, journalism specifically. It's what I went to school for. So it's great to be actually able to utilize that for the first time professionally. I'm really excited to be a part of the team. Uh, but if you want to see me talk more about movies a little bit more casually, you can go over to my YouTube channel, which is uh, Matt Garrett McDowell as well. Uh, got a lot of stuff there. Got a review for The Eternals coming whenever I get time. <laughs> uh, but I can, you can see my thoughts on that movie and a bunch of other silly stuff too. Yeah, guys. Great. Uh, go check out Garrett's work. Check him out on Twitter. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Uh, read read his uh, stuff on Screen Rant as it comes out. Um, you know, give give Garrett all the love and support um, that you might not even be giving me. It's okay, I understand. <laughs> but if you wanted to give me a little bit of love and support, I am of course your host Brandon Hanna. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon Hanna zero seven. Um, you could also find me on my YouTube channel, which you might already be here. Welcome, youtube.com slash Brandon Hanna. Uh, please, guys, hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell, as they say, so you don't miss a thing. I just got, you know, I just got to say that that's the thing to do. Yeah, and it's also, a YouTuber thing to do. I it's get it's it. a YouTuber it. thing to do. <laughs> and also, you know, I, I would really love to one day have like a thousand subscribers. Okay, oh, that'd be great. 
Maybe the I dream. don't think that's too much to ask. <laughs> that would be the dream. I know Garrett. Garrett's like I've doubled that dream already. That's oh, oh, you're too you're too kind. You're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also, if you know, if you do want to throw a little bit of support, I don't offer much, but you can also find me on patreoncom slash Hannah if you wanted to support the show. Um, I'll take that extra step. I would really appreciate it. But if not, totally understand. As they also say, select which tier is right for you. And if you also want to listen to the show on audio podcasts, that's that's what I need to remember. Uh, the show is available where all audio podcasts are sold. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, you name it. Um, subscribe over there. Leave a positive review. That would mean a whole lot to me. Um, and also, you know, I get like, you know, 15 cents every thousand listeners or something right now with the ad that I'm running on Anchor. So, you nice. know, if you want to throw a little coin my way you know, <laughs> how you listen afford to that new apartment you know exactly <laughs> listen on anchor um but with all that being said guys i think that just about wraps up our show thank you to everybody listening thank you once again to garrett this was a lot of fun super happy to be back talking to, about science um with my amazing friends and maybe even soon to be friends and all that whoever i get on this show it's gonna be a friend one way or another i hope <laughs> um but yeah now i'm just rambling on so i'm just gonna close out by saying thank you for taking time out of your day